Ruiz. Welcome back to the next part of this Truth and Rhythm episode. Be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. Also become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you so much for your interest and support. Enjoy. How'd you uh, then transition into your solo thing? Yeah, it was going to be... Uh... Peter and Jeff produced an album, you know, on another label for me because I I was free and they weren't from because they signed separately from me, you know, with the whole production thing. So I was free to go. So um, so many freaking weird things happened <laughs> with that. But um, you know, we shopped around and uh, we, we ended up going with Bob Krasnow over at Electra because he had a phenomenal roster. Uh, and, and reputation of loving black women's voices and, and doing right by them. So I wanted to be there because it was more boutique than like, you know, going to a Sony, which, you know, uh, would have been probably as good as well. But I wanted to be at a place that I knew the, my, my, my vibe would be appreciated. And he really was loving what we were doing. Um, so I, we came up with this uh, eclectic album um, that was, at, th at that time, I guess you would say it was like a female seal record. If you have to, you know, if you got to put, put a, a label on it, it would be a female seal-esque record. Um, and we loved it, you know, we, we all loved it and he was ready to do it and Blow it up, spent almost, we spent a lot of money on the record already. It's <laughs> like, I didn't want to mention number. Um, and I uh, just come back from the uh, photo shoot. We did a photo shoot in Jamaica and came back and realized that, that he had either been pushed out or he had stepped down from Electra. And it's like, oh, snap. <laughs> so, okay. And then the lady who was over at uh, Atlantic was now at Electra. Uh-oh. Because <laughs> she was upset that I left. I was like, yeah, my contract was up. So so my, my record was canned. <laughs> it was just canned. <laughs> wow. No sanctu people. sanctuary. Yes, that was sanctuary. Yeah. yeah. Wow, what a string of events, man. How did you um how did you cope with that? Not well. <laughs> Not well. Not well. No, I, you know, I mean, I'm honest. I, I allow myself to get down in dumps when I need to, because I believe if you don't do that, you, you, you harbor shit and you, you sit festers and makes you sick. You know, heart sick. And I don't want to, I don't, I don't, you know, I, I never wanted to allow that to, a sort of thing to take over my life. Um, but I allow it to take over moments periods so that I can go through it. You know, as the old folks tell you, tell us, you know, you, you got to get through it to get to it. So that's what I try to do. I go through the, the, the darkness to, you know, to get to the other side. Do you feel like that happened um, more personal as more of a personal thing or just a, um, I don't know if taste is the right word. But is her sensibility, was it more personal or sensibility, do you think? I mean, since she never explained to me and she said, yeah, I just don't really, I don't really hear it, you know. That's not an, that's not a, that, I personally, my opinion is that it was just 
uh, like a get back at me kind of thing. It was a gr- grudge. Yeah. Yeah. You had, you left. You left. Mm. So I just, I thought, you know what? And I'm not saying that's exactly what it is, but that is my gut feeling. Sadly. And you had some great people on that record too. Are you kidding? Man, that record was beautiful. Yeah, Daryl Hall was on that record. Vernon Reed was on there. Yeah. I mean, uh, did Taylor Dane sing background? Oh, no, she didn't. Did she sing background? Yeah. Did she, she did yeah. sing background on something. Yeah, yeah man. I mean, we, <laughs> we, it was a great, it was the, 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 the whole making of that album was beautiful. It was just beautiful. Up, up, and, up through the photo shoot, it was just, a, it was just felt felt like touched by God the whole experience of making that record. So mm-hmm. when I got back in the car on the way home and found that out, it was like, <laughs> did, did you know? Uh, I know uh, Doug Wimbush was on there too. Did you know those guys? Did Living Color do some shows with Family Stan? We actually used to do gigs together. I, I don't know if we were the shows together, but we were always in the same sets. But uh, do a show. We did a not back then, not back then, but later on we did a, a show together. Uh, La, La Poisson Rouge, I think it was. But yeah, you know, we were all in each up in each other's sets all the time. You know. But yes, Doug Wimbush. Oh my God, he killed playing on uh, Springtime in Hell. Ooh, he killed on that. Yeah, that was no. It was some dope sessions. Well, it took uh, forever, but it's seen the light of day. People can get it. Um, they should know that through uh, Bandcamp. So, yes, yes, I'm just following my heart, <laughs> so I put it on Bandcamp. Yeah, you know, there's a song on there uh, that Prince used. He changed the title to Soul Sanctuary. <laughs> So, um, and, and and there were there there are like four other songs on this record that uh, Prince Prince has done versions of, um, and some of those, if you're a Prince fan, you, people have you know these bootleg copies of these <laughs> okay bootleg copies of because then. If you go back and listen to and listen to the the original versions of where they came from, they're still, they're totally different, but they both they both still have a vibe. But that I think is authentic and dope, you know, because he princified he princified five songs, so much, you know, which was amazing to have uh, have him do. That's a huge honor. Yeah, did you get to meet Prince? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, a few times. A few times. Another Gemini brother. <laughs> how, how did he strike you in those encounters? Um, He was friendly. He was, you know, he was friendly. He, he reminds me of Gemini. He's sort of uh, quiet and, and making little jokes. And, you know, this is like... I remember one time I met him, he was just sucking on lollipops the whole time. <laughs> um, and we had a, you know, we, had a, we were going to actually get together and write some songs. But we never got together to write. So he just worked on these songs. And, um, and at the end of the day, um, I mean, he, I love Prince and I, uh, you know he's he's also one off one of a kind uh, person and artist, um, but we could not come come to sort of a meeting of the, a melding of the spirits of what my record should be, and um, the question then becomes: as an artist, as a woman, as a grown woman, <laughs> you know, do I just do what he says, uh, which? I don't, these songs don't fit me, <laughs> you know, or do I not? And I decided at that moment not to, and I don't regret it because um, I would hate to, to, to 
jump off the path of being real and truthful with myself because it's Prince. Because then it's not for me. It's for Prince. Because it's, because I want to say Prince, you know, those are the wrong motives for me. And of course, there's the consequences. Everything, you know. Uh, maybe I, there would have been a, a Sandra Six, <laughs> and I'd done those records. I would never want to be in Sandra Six. But those songs that he wrote were for like a Sandra Six, and I'm like, oh, I don't want to do that, <laughs> you know. So had I had I become Sandra Six. You know, maybe I'd be more depressed, <laughs> you know, than I ever was because I had to pretend to be something that I, I wasn't. Mm -hmm. So that's why I didn't do the songs, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, probably the female I think of the closest to you that was part of his thing was maybe uh, Rosie Gaines, you know. And, um, you know, she also ended up having to go her own her own way. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. He had, a, he had a certain idea about wh how women should, you know, perform and uh, what they should sing about. And and I think it worked out for Sheila E. But honestly, for everybody else, I don't, I don't, I don't, it didn't, you know, it didn't work because it wasn't them. Sheila yeah. E was a drummer, you know, is, you know, so she could make that thing work and be sexy and the whole thing that works. She wasn't just up there posing and primping and she was playing. She's oh, a yeah. musician, so can't, you know, that gave a whole lot of validity. It added weight to the, the six thing. <laughs> you know? so, um, but everybody else, I think, I mean, yeah, Vanity, Apollone, those are, that's, they, they weren't artists that he was trying to fit into a box. They were people that he was making into this artist. That's why that it was interchangeable, Vanity, Apollone, because it was just be that. And that works for them. But when you try to take uh, a Prince, total princeified production and put on top of a Nona Hendrix, a Patti LaBelle, you know, who, who already has a thing, you can hear the, I can hear the tension there. I can hear the, where it's not there. <laughs> you know, something's, well, he, something's off. <laughs> even when he produced the one, the one Shaka album, you know, um, it's it seemed to be like a dream match and two of my favorites of all time um but it's still not it didn't come together as great as you might imagine you know there's it's got it's, moment it's got moments it's got moments it's got yeah. moments yes yeah there's some, there are, there are some real oh yes moments and there's some also um and that's what that just that's where that clash comes in is this going to be a Prince record or it's going to be a Shocker record? So sometimes it's a Prince record and sometimes it's a Shocker record. <laughs> and then a couple of those moments where it's like, yeah, it's a, a Shocker record that Prince did. You know, this, 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 that's when it works. If, when the artist to, it is, is artist forward, you know, and and he's doing his thing to support the artist. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I have to do to support an artist when I'm seeing background. Yes. Yeah, so, um. It's a very interesting dynamic, all of that stuff, you know. You ever see, you ever see that clip of um, her doing Sweet Thing with him on guitar and on stage? Yeah, the YouTube video. I've seen that. I've seen yeah. That. See, that works out well because it's more of a supportive thing. And yeah. she's able to totally do her thing. <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant. But uh, so, but it, huge compliment, obviously, that he, uh, you know, thought enough oh. of your lyrics. and For sure. Are you kidding? Yeah, I, I will wear that badge. Yes, <laughs> I will wear that badge. Yeah, I was like, okay, okay. Yeah, the Prince thing your song? Did he sing your lyrics? No? Oh, okay. <laughs> no, that's, uh, that That will always be uh, for me, you know, that and then the Curtis thing, which is just ever, ever, forever grateful for those. Yeah, so uh, tell people about the Curtis Mayfield. Sure. Uh, Curtis was uh, going to studio. We were both on Warner Brothers, and um, and he had done uh, he recorded a lot of it. He had done a duet with Mavis Staples. He had done one with uh, Aretha Franklin, and uh, the label wanted him to do one with a young up and coming artist. You know, so he could you know you know it should be in bring him into the 
the, the youth. So they offered him three singers and he chose me. So that's like, yeah. <laughs> Did Curtis Mayfield choose you? No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well you were super fly um what uh what year was that 96 95 95 96 one of those yeah what, what how did he strike you what was curtis like oh my god i love i love him i love that man this is the most genuine soul i've ever met i mean Hands down. Um, he had nothing to prove. He had nothing to, you know, he was just who he was. Um, and very, very real, very honest and very open with uh, uh, what what he thought, his opinions about, you know, stuff I could ask him, anything. And um, he was also, he was he just sort of became an ear for me, and, uh, almost like a grievance ear. I mean, it was, was weird because this man was, you know, Paralyzed, um, laying on his back, you know, giving me advice on how to survive this business and how not to let it get you. And, you know, he he really really did hold me up through uh, uh, another one of those rough patches, and uh, that just made him a treasure for me. He was he's he's he's, he's really. That man is an American treasure, but he is a personal treasure for me. And just a songwriter, songwriter, too, I think. Songwriter, arranger, producer. Everything, you know. He's a giant. <laughs> Absolute and, giant. And that was, you know, 10 years prior, well, more than that, I guess 12 years prior, you were part of Shaka's Renaissance. Curtis really had a renaissance with that album, you know, it helped really yeah. shine a light on him for a whole new generation. A whole new generation, which is, that was the goal for the label. And they, they, they did accomplish that. You know, my favorite song on there is not even the one I did. My favorite song is uh, the, uh, Here But I'm Gone. Oh my God, I love that song. It's like one of the songs I have to play two, three times in a row when I play it, you know. It says a lot about him, you know. Yeah. Mm. So um, you did finally get a solo record released. Yeah, eventually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what what did you do differently as part of that process? And you know, how did you feel when it finally hit the streets? Good grief. Um, mm. What was how was this one different? It wasn't as uh magic it was more it was it was more like a uh uh work i had to get these you know we used different producers so i had to travel to them and record with write with them record with them and find a vibe with them and all that stuff so it wasn't as i would think uh, i would say organic as uh, the sanctuary album was um but it had moments that that i can refer to that were organic and that was um knocked up and locked down which was uh produced by mark batson this is one of the sessions that just flowed one of the writing i wrote that in just an hour or two in the afternoon as soon as i heard the track i just started singing it and um don't bring me down a session with mixo just it was one of them flowing moments so those those felt very you know that felt it felt like me you know getting coming through that was me that was me you know, really coming through and i had fun a lot of fun writing mag diva you know that song was just like fun to because i was a character i was making this character and i'm like yeah what was she what was she what would she be doing what would she do to you? you know, I was trying to come up with, you know, this is outside of me. Now people refer to me as Mac Deep. I'm like, well, okay, but I'm not really, okay. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Yvonne again, I don't know. 
<laughs> yep. That's my thought immediately. <laughs> yeah, but it was that. There were a few moments moments on the album that I really I really I really dig if I look back at it seriously. Oh, well, it's got so much, you know, personality and so much um attitude, you know. And, yeah, uh, we did. That was, you know, once we hit on Mac Diva. Oh yeah, we st- we really started shooting, right, having fun, just to sh- shooting our shot, as they say. Oh, but I, it was a little intro, the little uh, intro and the the interludes with me and the girls, you know, talking. Those things were a blast. <laughs> no, it was just a blast. We just recorded us hanging out, talking shit. <laughs> How would you feel about the reception it got? Of course, disappointed because you want to, you want, you know. You want more, as many people as possible to get what you're doing. I understood why it happened because if the label was going through another another transition, this was now it was on Warner Brothers, and right before, was it right before my second single? No, excuse me. Right after they had released the first single, we had done a video. Um. The whole department was fired, <laughs> basically, <laughs> and, and uh, the head of the new the promotions for the 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 new head of the promotions didn't. He basically said, "I don't get this record. I don't get it." So he just decided not to promote it, and that's what happened. So I know what happened. <laughs> so I don't. I don't actually blame the album. I don't blame the, the creativity. I, I, it's easy. It would be easy to say, well, I just have to do a better, better record. And I always try to do better anyway. That's just part of growth and continue not to let yourself, uh, you know, f- st- slide into, you know, being sedated with <laughs> any past successes. Um, so I always try to grow and, and expand. But the reality was that, that he basically just didn't want to promote it. He didn't. He just didn't promote it. So you don't promote it, don't get out there. Period. <laughs> you know, uh, tis what it is. Yeah. But to this day, a lot of people still know that record, and I think the reason a lot of people know this record is because I believe one of the last things they did before they the, there was a, 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 all women uh, staff. One of the last things they did was put "Come Over" on the uh, Martin Lawrence soundtrack with Lynn uh, Whitfield of. Um, uh, uh, a thin line between love and hate and putting come over on that soundtrack that 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 got the album you know into places where it wasn't before uh because they were who's saying that and those people went back and discovered the album but it wasn't because of pr- promotion <laughs> it was because of that almost accidental thing <laughs> mm. um I'm not sure what year was coined. I'm sure it was coined by them, but you know, what was your perspective of the whole, you know, Neil Soul uh label and movement and you know, where'd you stand on that? Yeah, I didn't I didn't like that. <laughs> so I don't like, you know, I'm hard with labels anyway. But Neo Soul was like, okay. Shit, even the the dude that, you know, Kidar was my brother back then. Um he even buried it eventually. He actually went to it, had a tombstone stone engraved with Neil Soul. He went out and bur- buried the term. So it's taking nothing away from him, but I, I never liked that term because soul is soul. And um, why gotta be Neil? Why gotta be new? But you know, uh, I didn't get it. I, I, and I saw all of the the acts that were in that bag, you know, and my album didn't fit that bag. And it maybe knocked up and locked down could have fit in that bag, but they always lumped me in with Neo Soul, which was, I didn't fit there, you know. I don't fit places, and I think that's really the main, you know, that's the main, I don't fit in a lot of easily, you know, assigned bags. And uh, that means I have to have my own name, and. You know? Uh, and stay there and do that and try to do that as best I can. Yeah. It's called being unique and being an artist. Yeah, man. Yeah. You know, it's like, pretty much. Yeah. 
Yeah. Mm. Um, it's funny because, you know, you mentioned uh, funk before and uh, I feel like it's never gotten its due as a um, genre uh, as it should on equal footing with others. So that kind of gets, you know, buried a little bit, but then something like Neo Soul, they're like, oh, we can really market this. So let's really use this, you know? Right, right. Yeah, it's weird, right? <laughs> it's like, huh? Wait, well, so why can't you market funk? Why can't you? Yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't have an explanation for that. Uh, it doesn't really jibe with my, my whole thing, you know? Um, I just think if it's good music and it's a good artist, you should be able to f figure out a business plan to make it work and to to profit and the whole thing. Uh, but I think folks, folks just sort of sort of follow a bandwagon. Oh, that worked out. All right, let's get a bunch of those. You know, <laughs> so uh, yeah. Oh no, that doesn't fit this. So let's not do that. You know, but that's dope. That's dope too. You know, <laughs> and, uh, you can't treat a whole swath of population the population like they're sixth graders but that's what they do <laughs> so it's given the, the you know the, the watered down version of everything people can uh more easily deal with simplisticness exactly so and, and uh, they don't have to you know jump into your next uh, record sandra gemini uh took five years but um that one came and uh i really like that album um thank you you know, just um, it's got a slipping in a darkness cover, which is, you know, certainly done in a very interesting treatment. And, yeah. um, you know, Dizzy, uh, you know, great guests again and bringing Roy back, you know. Yes, yes, yes. Call back. Yeah. Yeah, that was a great session, too. Um, that album, it took so long because I didn't have a deal, you know, and um and I had already started recording for this, this next record on Warner. So, all right, I got songs. I'm already starting, I'm starting to, you know, pull this thing together. So then I had to try to finish it with, you know, without any budget, just with me, you know, <laughs> you know, getting songs from friends and tracks and producers that I had connections with and, and uh, filling out an album. And then trying to figure out if that was the beginning uh, of the the independent artist boom. It was two thousand. It's like, all right, you can we can do this on. What was that girl, Andy DeFranco, who uh, really did it all? I was like, okay, we can just release it online. So uh, I just I decided to go that route. Uh, then of course, expansion over in the UK offered to to pick it up, and that got it over there with Ralph T. Um, Got it. Yeah, they got it a lot more exposure. Um, being on expansion, and he put it on a couple of a few, a couple of songs on those luxury soul releases that he did once a year. Um, but that album was it. It was disjointed because of that. Because it was, you know, I, I sort of picked and you know, I tried to place them. The songs, the cuts on on the on sides, you know, because I realized, okay, this this really this is a story, this is another story, so that makes sense anyway. So that's why I did it, Gemini, both sides. Um, and, um, and I think I mean that's a lot of people's favorite record of mine, actually, which is like wow, that's the one without a label, <laughs> you know. You leave, get out of my business, don't do it. <laughs> you know? It'll be hard for me to pick one, but it, it might be that one. I really like it. Um, yeah. So, um, you uh, found your way back with the family stand. Um, yes. How and why did that come back together? Um, I think was, at that point, I was over, was I over here. Yeah, I moved to the Netherlands at that point. And, um, you know, I was putting, I was also I was producing events. And so I want to get the fam stand over here, you know, because they love fam stand over here in Europe, you know. Um, so we put together a family stand tour. And then after we did the tour, it's like, we need to, let's show, look, we can do this. Let's, let's make a record, you know. So we did some recordings and, um, and released those. I think the first one was via uh, Go. 
Entertainment over here. It's a, a Dutch label for the uh, Jacques de Brown, really dope music man who has a label. And uh, I think the next one was the next one was Shock. I don't remember how we did the next one. We did like two albums independently like that. Somewhere in there. <laughs> the 2000s. <laughs> Were you, do, you doing the Daughters of Soul yet? Or did that come after the reunion? I started that. That was, that was, I did Daughters of Soul before. I started uh, Daughters of Soul in 2004. And I think the Family Stand stuff, I think we started 2007. Maybe. So the Daughters of Soul, um, who were the uh, people in the first one you did? Uh, the first one was Layla Hathaway and um, Lisa Simone and Indira Khan and as, as the Daughters of the Legends. And then I have what I call the Spiritual Daughters of Soul, which was Nona Hendrix from LaBelle, Joyce Kennedy from... Uh, Mother's Finest and Sandra St. Victor from the Family Stand was with, with, with all three of us with our rocky edged spiritual daughter of the soul. So I thought it'd be a nice mix to have us do, do these gigs together and you know, pair, pair Nona Hendrix with Simone, pair Layla Hathaway with, with, with you know, with Joyce and pair, I mean, I actually pair Layla with me and um, Lisa with Nona. Right. So I mean, I, it was just doing duets that were unexpected uh, these d different stylized folks and oh my god those shows were so much fun it was so much i mean audiences were on their feet for two hours two hours ten minutes it was brilliant absolutely brilliant wow i would love to have seen that um did you already know all of them uh, or did you kind of i knew to... most of them i knew most of my joyce uh i had never met uh, but oh my God, it, anytime baby love comes on to this day, I'm going to get up and just lose it. So, so I was like, I got to find Joyce Kennedy. But uh, everybody else I, I knew, you know, so, you know, uh, of course, Indira is like my, my niece, you know, um, and uh, Layla, we had met, but we weren't really friends yet then. Nona I knew from New York, you know, the scene, you know, we run into it all, all the time. And we'd actually started doing some recordings together as well uh, for my album. So she started writing some songs in the 90s for me. So, yeah, pretty much. Oh, and Lisa Simone. I did not know Lisa Simone, but I forgot how I met her. But <laughs> that's so wild. I forgot how I met her. Um, but um we we got to you know we'd have any problems getting you know uh people interested in it because it was really a cool concept um and you know we paid everybody well you know i didn't get paid but i paid everybody well <laughs> i did it for the love you know what i said don't do <laughs> it's exactly what i did um but i want to make sure everybody got paid because i wanted it to continue uh, and then later on, we actually, you know, we brought in, brought in Karen Wheeler uh, to be, used to be one of the spiritual daughters. And we brought in Leah McRae, who is the daughter of two icons, the daughter of, of um, the people whose names I can't remember right now. George. George, <laughs> George and. Uh, George Car McRae. Car Car Carmen? No, not Carmen. No, not Carmen. George McRae. And. No, oh no, that's so sad. Gwen. His mama had a hit too. Gwen? Gwen? Gwen McCray. Yeah. Jesus. She had a hit too, though. What was her hit? Wasn't it wasn't it also something with rock? Rock Maybe like he had rock yeah. and chair, a Rocky Baby. Rock me baby or Rock Me Baby. Somewhere. And then she no, she had her own fly ass hit. Well, we got luck I looked that up. But uh, anyway, um we had her and uh, on a few of them as well. Karen Wheeler. Uh, oh, and then we brought Denise Williams in for uh, uh, one one of the tours. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, that's something I'm very proud of as well that that I pulled that off. You know, oh, it's amazing. Yeah, congratulations um, for for doing that and and continuing that legacy. And how many of them in total have you done? Do you know? Well, I don't know how many shows, but I know we did it over a period of four years. Um, and every it was every summer 
for the festival season, I bring them in, whatever adoration I, I could pull together, you know. Um, I, I would have loved to continue doing it, but, you know, it, it is an expensive show, you know. So, yeah, I mean, you can't bring that many women over and, <laughs> and, and, uh, and artists over and not treat them well and pay them well. I mean, I, I would also have uh, my therapist give everybody massages, you know, and everybody had nice rooms. And um, I mean, it wasn't a luxury tour, but it was a well taken care of situation that I thought, you know, everybody deserved. I would think in particular, Nona must be somebody that you really um, um, emulate or idolize a little bit because of the way she's done her career, you know? Nona Hendrick is everything. You hear me? <laughs> okay. Nona Hendrick is everything. So, like, oh man, she yeah, she writes. She 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 produces. She performs her ass off. She can, I mean, she just she is really the full package on stage and behind stage and in the studio. She is the full package. And she's serious, man. She's just, she's about her business, okay? She is about her business. And she's re really definitely someone that I look to for smarts as far as moves, you know. Okay, that's, yeah, you know. I would like to run stuff across her desk, you know, before I do something real. Because she is somebody that thinks through everything. You know, she and, thinks and, so. and creatively, she's, I see her as fearless and she follows her muse. Thank you. Yeah. 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 See, that's the, that, 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 that's the inspiration right there. Her whole thing is an inspiration because of that. She goes th through life figuring out what she digs and how she could, could pull that off in a different way this time. You know, she got a, she got a, a damn electric dress that she plays. <laughs> <laughs> she has, you know, she wears a thing. She just that she can make music on the dress. The woman is a wonder, just a wonder, <laughs> you know. So, no, I, I told, I told, I tell her she's my spirit animal. <laughs> she's like, yo, oh, I love me some, I love me some Miss Hendricks. Absolutely. So, why why did you choose to move to uh, Europe? Well, I wasn't going to move here. I was actually, in the, in, uh, after 9-11 uh, happened in the States, I have asthma. And uh, being in New York City, it was really messing with my lungs, honestly. Go just Every time I had to go to the city, I was like, okay, you know what? Let me just get out for a minute. And then, you know, I was there. I think right after that, also, George Bush stole another election. So I was like, okay, I really need to leave this playing for a minute so the idea was to sort of gypsy around europe you know you know friends here friends there go hang out there go hang out here go see that person go i was gonna just you know do a bunch of jam sessions sleep on some couches that, that was my idea you know i just put my daughter off in the dormitory all right right baby i'll be i'll be right back <laughs> i'll be back in about a year all right you good all right <laughs> so she told she tells me mom you just dumped me i'm like <laughs> Baby, I couldn't breathe there. I couldn't breathe. <laughs> and I got over here and uh, an old boyfriend of mine for my touring days, I had asked him to come pick me up and because my first stop was going to be the Netherlands and I knew he was here. So I called and asked him to pick me up. And he said, no problem. He picked me up and he dropped me off at my a girlfriend's house who I was where I was going to stay. And, and we started going out, you know, again and just hanging out and um, long story short, two children later, um, he's downstairs. I'm married to him. <laughs> and one of our children are in college. <laughs> this is her last year of high school. So I'm still in the Netherlands where I was trying to gypsy around Europe and I'm still here. <laughs> so that's what happened. You know, so it wasn't a plan to leave the States. I was, you know, just trying to breathe for a minute. Hmm. <laughs> well, it sounds like it's worked out. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> here we are. <laughs> so, 
I have an album called Olya's Daughter, which I really love. Um, and I, I released it through a, a, a UK a digital, digital company called Believe. And I love that record because that record, um, it's, it's a lot of stories, a lot of, a lot of stories that I told. It's just I, I was being very frank with myself and very frank uh, via myself to my audience. And I, I went away. I started writing it here. Mark DeClive Low Simp gave me all these tracks and he, as a, he gave me the tracks as an album. And he was, you know, it's just, I've never created like that before. He said, here are 11 or 12 or many instrumental tracks. This is an album. I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> Let me see. And I, and I was like, damn, I do like all of them. And I, he, uh, was, he gave me more than that. And I weeded them down to the ones I really dug. And it was like a year and a half, maybe two years that I hadn't, I could, couldn't finish it. And he was like, yeah, what, 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 so. I said, I can't, I'm just, I'm in the house with the kids and it's, you know, it's busy. They were younger than they were running around. I got to take them here, I got to do this, I got to cook, I got to, you know, I just couldn't do it. So I uh, said, so you know what? I'm doing it. I'm going to rent. I rented a cabin in the woods, like 40 minutes from my house in the middle of the woods, but log cabin. I took my my computer, my logic, my mics, my amps, my my computer, everything. and I And I sat there for a month. And I finished writing and recording that how recorded that album in that month, and it's real, really real for me. Uh, it's very true for the, the stories. <laughs> so, so I, I like that album. And that came out what year? That must have been twenty thirteen, I think. Yeah. And how was the reception? You know, what kind of feedback? And well, people, the people that heard it really liked it. But again, we we doing something independently like that. You know, I'm not really expecting to hit Beyonce numbers. I just want to get my music out there and and get my uh, get my stories told. Have it in my pantheon, so to speak. Because I did that. I said that. I meant that. I felt it. I meant it. And I did it. <laughs> so it's there now. So um, that's kind of how I travel, you know, what I feel, what I'm, what I'm feeling. I want to say that, <laughs> you know, and I want to put it out there. And then it's part of the pantheon. Whatever happens to it happens. Do you ever get to perform any of those tracks? I did. I did. I did some of them. Uh, yeah, we I did some some shows in New York in 2013 or 14. I think it was. <laughs> Love that the band loves the songs too, man. Because you know, you know, they look funky, quirky, you know, quirky and funky, and you know, so it's like it's got a vibe, you know. And I did, and I wanted the songs to all flow into each other. So, you know, for me, the album has a a real you know continuity that that Jim and I even it missed for me because how I had to create that album. You know, each, each album, each album has, you know, it's, 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 it's pro personalities and it has its, its eccentricities and some of those are good and some of those are bad. And I accept and love them all. <laughs> well, I just, the, the life stories around them are fascinating too, you know? Especially, yeah, uh, especially when you know you've done them at different parts of or stages of your life and career. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. That's why I'm, I think when I when I think about I say pantheon like not like I'm you know, <laughs> but I say it just because I do feel like a body of work should really reflect who you are and where you've been. So I try to do things that will reflect who I am and where I've been. So when I'm gone. It's all right there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what have you been working on more recently? Um, you got I something am, coming? Yeah. Well, coming is a, is a very strong word. <laughs> <laughs> I always have my 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 writer and producer friends um, threatening to kidnap me if I don't uh, record something. So I'm going to do that, <laughs> but I um, I do have some songs. My cousin 
uh, I have another cousin who was just won a Grammy and he got, he's up for another Grammy next month as a producer and songwriter. And um, I have some of his songs that I, I'm going to finish, some of his tracks I'm going to finish. I have some tracks for my my uh, keyboard player, Tom Hammer, for my bass player, Leslie. And I want to put those out, songs out, not as an album. I want to put them out, just sort of dribble and drabble, maybe once a month or whatever. Uh, as a collective piece that I'm calling my inside voice. And I'm saying that because... I want to write songs that are story and tone focused. I'm not setting out to do acrobatics vocally. I'm not setting out to hit a bunch of high notes, you know, or low notes, or I just want to tell stories and sing songs that feel authentic, that are authentic. So it's my inside voice. So I'm going to put these songs out as a collective uh, of, of, of that. This one. That's, that's what I'm working on alongside. I'm also writing a screenplay, but I won't even get into that because that's, that's a whole other thing. But musically, that's what I'm doing. Mm. And if you had to guess, when do you think people might get exposure to that? Um, if I'm going to do it where I want to do it, probably the late spring, starting in the late spring. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I would say now, late spring, early summer. Yeah. See, now you've committed to it. I said probably. <laughs> <laughs> I did say probably. Don't try to get, listen, Scott, listen, don't be blackmailing me. Don't be calling me talking about it. I, I, I recorded you say, don't want to hear it. <laughs> don't call for me, Scott. <laughs> what, what about on stage? Singing? Yeah, I mean, I'm not. I'm I'm not itching to get back on on the stage at this moment because I want to have something else to offer. Yeah, I mean, folks. Oh, you gonna do the show? Yeah, but yeah. I mean, <laughs> no. I wanna I wanna do something. I wanna do something. I wanna say something. I wanna. No, I don't. I can sing. Sure, I can sing in the house too. <laughs> so, I um. I just don't have that. I'm not. I'm not raring to, to go. I'm raring to create. I'm raring to. You know, once that baby is born, maybe then I want to show her off. Mm. You know. So. A- any chance of family stand activity? Yeah, Peter called me last week. You know, he he wants to. Uh, he has some ideas. So we we are we're you know those, those are my brothers forever. You know, we'll all, always be doing figure something out to do. You know, I don't know how often it'll be, but uh, we're always together one way or another. You know? they'll, they'll certainly be a part of my in, my inside voice collection, you know, one way or another. Yeah. And I know you have a pretty nice website. Why don't you share with everybody what that is and how they can sort of, you know, find out when you're sure. Your Honestly, the best place to to know what I'm doing on a day to day is just my Instagram, um, which is to just Sandra St. Victor. Um, and um, the, the website is Sandra St. Victor.com. Um, but of course I don't upgrade update that as much as I should, but I do try to keep, you know, I go back and make sure uh, that uh, the, the Instagram, all those things are loading there as well. So that, if you go there, you know, you'll see what's happening. And your complete catalogs on Bandcamp now, right? Uh, yeah, I think I did. Do that. Yeah, I think so. I did I put all his daughter up? <laughs> did I put all his daughter up? I don't know. Well, most of it, if not all. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Bandcamp is, of course, also my name, Sandra St. Victor on Bandcamp. So definitely go there and if you haven't heard Sanctuary, and if you're, if you're a Prince fan, for sure, just to compare those songs with his versions of them, it's very interesting Interesting to, to listen to them side by side. Yeah, and that was on his Emancipation album in 96. Right. So if sexual. anybody's looking for that, yeah. Yes. Um, before I let you go, just a couple more questions. One is, you know, if you had to pick one or two of the most unforgettable 
experiences that you had performing on stage, what would they be and why? There was one time that I was with Roy Ayers. It wasn't a Roy show. We Roy had already done his show and we went to this club to hang out. That's what it was. We went to this club to hang out. Yes. Went to a club to hang out. I was sitting at the bar next to Larry Blackman of Cameo, who I really wanted to get away from because I was too, too young for him to be flirting with me. <laughs> and Roy, yes. Okay, that's what it is. So, so, so Roy gets on stage to jam with the band. You know who the band was? James Brown. So James Brown, he gets on stage with James Brown. And and he's up to doing they do they doing that and he calls me up on stage to to jam with them. So I'm up there jamming jamming on some James Brown riff with Roy Ayers and James Brown. So that was that's fun. Wow. That's fun. Was that your only, only only exposure to the Godfather of Soul? Yeah. Yeah. No, my dad took me to a James Brown show when I was a kid too. He did take him to James Brown. So I saw James Brown as a kid, a very young kid. He tells me that. I don't remember that show. <laughs> <laughs> my dad said he took me. Um, uh, yeah, I think the other the other biggest things that I would that come to mind are um the first time I did these huge festivals in Europe with Family Stan and we did we did Pink Pop and we did Glastonbury. Glastonbury, I mean, it's like $50,000, 50,000 people. I think Glastonbury was almost 100,000, which was insane, you know. And um, at Pink Pop, we did um, the show. We were on a show with uh, the big suit guy. Uh, <laughs> David Byrne? David Byrne. He was on that set. Soundgarden was on that yeah. show. And, um, and, my favorite memory of that was not being on stage. Well, yes, being on stage in the whole audience is saying, God, it's your rest or my rest. Oh, no, these are all white people. <laughs> you know, they all knew these, these songs. So that was amazing. But after the show, the dude from Soundgarden, the lead singer, you know, Chris, Cornel, Chris Cornell. Chris, right, Chris Cornell. I thought he was so cute. And, you know, remember, this is not nowadays. This was back then. This was the 90s. And I was like, can I kiss your lips? <laughs> and he said, sure. <laughs> Kissed him smack on the lips. Them beautiful lips. <laughs> wow. I kissed Chris. <laughs> I was very bold back in the day. <laughs> I just kissed him on the lips. And he enjoyed it. <laughs> so, that's a fun memory. <laughs> <laughs> that's great stuff thanks for sharing that no problem <laughs> um gonna make you think a little bit more before we part ways here and that is you know i often like to ask guests uh, sandra if they could only have five albums for a desert island for all time you know well, what would terrible. be those those five i know that's a well, terrible question they, they, they can't oh be ones that, that that you're a part of Ooh, wow. Oh, good Lord. Ooh, man, how do I break down? Which Stevie Wonder album? Oh, ooh. Inner Visions, a music of my mind. One of those. <laughs> um, Ella Fitzgerald, Live in Hollywood. Live in New Orleans by Maze. Mm. I love that freaking album. That yeah. album, it takes me there all the time. How many was that? Oh, Ask Rufus. I love that album. And, uh, um, that's the um, Doug and Gene Carn record. Okay, that's five. Okay, that's five. Okay, <laughs> and that all that just that's so the tip of just the top of the dome. I can't <laughs> cannot answer that question. Well, I'll, I'll I'll uh break the tie for you on uh, Stevie. I'll say Inner Visions because that's my favorite. Stevie probably my all right, cool. <laughs> all right, <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, what are your five? Oh God. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Turn the tables on you, didn't it, Scott? <laughs> You're yeah, the first buddy. person to do that, amazingly. <laughs> People scared. I ain't scared. <laughs> do, you, do you really want to know? Yes, I do. Well, of course, it can't just be five, but five See? that would be in that running, I would say it would be like Prince Sign of the Times, uh, Stevie Wonder Interventions. Um, Parliament Mothership Connection, Ohio Players Honey, mm. 
It could be Isley Brothers Go For Your Guns or um Oh damn, that's a good one too. Or Earth Wind of Earth Wind of Fire. Um oh my God, how did I leave Earth Wind of Fire? All in all. All in all, yes. Dun, 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 dun. Which one is Be Ever Wonderful on? It's on that. Okay. Yeah. That's the one. That's yeah. the one. That's got serpentine fire. It's got fantasy. It's... That's the one. That's the yeah. one. That's the one. See, I see it because five, man, because I knew I, I knew I had to have a little sort of that gets my jazz, but I would also want to have some. If I'm on an island. I'm gonna need uh, something to get jumping in. So I would put one like Hezekiah Walker, just live yeah. by any means necessary. I need a gospel thing in there. So I'll do something like that with a lot of fire. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, for variety's sake, I would like like a Herbie Hancock also, and yeah, right. Um, yeah. So, man. Yeah, that's five, a tough one. Man. Give us ten. Give I didn't realize 10. how cru- I didn't realize how cruel my question was. <laughs> mirror <Yeah>. baby <laughs> well sandra um gotta let you go but um one final question and that is you know as you look back uh on your career what are you most proud of probably curtis mayfield duet because he's uh he's an icon he is really you know almost a blueprint for you know black excellence and for him to choose to sing a duet with me when he had options of two other people who had names who, who had already had records out you know he chose me <clears throat> that gives me a serious you know feeling of valid <laughs> you know validation and um just deep deep Humble love for that. That's that's it. He's it. Yeah, makes sense <laughs> to me for sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, congratulations on that, and congratulations on everything you've accomplished. And thank you so much for bringing so much great music to all of our ears and our hearts. Thank you, Scott. Man, thank you for doing this again. Appreciate you so much. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Truth and Rhythm. A big thank you goes out to our guest as well as to you, the viewer and listener. Also, much gratitude to Pleasure for supplying the show's funky opening and closing music. As a reminder, you can always access the complete list of linked shows by episode at funkinstuff.net. I urge you to support this program and receive the extra benefits along with that by subscribing to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube and sharing it with funk, R&B, and jazz lovers, joining Truth and Rhythm's membership program at Patreon, submitting a donation at funkandstuff.net, buying Everything is on the One, the first guide to funk book at Amazon, shopping at the Funky Things store for cool merchandise at funkandstuff.net, and linking through funkandstuff.net for all of your Amazon purchases. In addition, if you're an artist or anyone seeking proven, results-oriented, professional marketing, PR, writing, or editing consultation or production, check out the media services section at funkinstuff.net. Also, I encourage you to drop me a line at scottg at funkinstuff.net. I love the feedback, suggestions, guest requests, appearance and sponsorship inquiries, and just talking about my favorite subject, groove-based music. For now, and as always, this is Scott Dr. GX Goldfine saying, keep on keep vibing, on vibing to the rhythm of the one. Mm-hmm.